And you should be able to share your screen. Can you see my screen? Yeah. Wonderful. All right. Okay, great. All right, uh, sorry, this is very casual. You introduce yourself. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Um, so thanks for, for inviting us. Um, I'm Natalie Christian. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Louisville in biology. Rachel, do you want to introduce yourself too? Sure, I'm Rachel Pig. I'm also in biology. Um, and so we are presenting on some work that we've been doing over the last year, thanks to um, an Embry Cure Award. Um, so we're talking about how we have been integrating molecular biology and ecology through a soil microbiome cure, our course-based undergraduate research experience. Um, and before we get started, I want to acknowledge the other key personnel on this project, Nico Sabalin Jabbles and Jeff Masters, who are our co-instructors for this course that we'll be talking about, uh, as well as um, the undergraduate and graduate teaching assistants that are part of this course, um, our department chair, Perry Eason, um, and our, our funding source. Um, so if you're not familiar, course-based undergraduate research experiences um, are a way of getting more undergraduate students involved in research um, during their undergraduate tenures. Um, so we, we know from the literature and probably just our own sense of working with undergraduates that when they have research experiences, it improves their retention in their major and in school. Um, it promotes, um, at least in the case of STEM fields, scientific literacy and reasoning, senses of belonging, um, and also increases their uh, probability of pursuing STEM related careers. And so undergraduate research experiences can be really formative and really important for students. Um, but we face this problem where we have a difficulty in getting all undergraduate students doing research. Um, oftentimes they're limited by the number of positions that faculty have in their labs. Um, lots of students work um, while they're in school and so they might not have time to also pursue research um, or just don't know about the opportunities that they have in getting involved in faculty research. And so cures or course-based undergraduate research experiences are these sort of alternative opportunities where we can actually create a real research experience inside embedded in a class, embedded in a course that students enroll in um, so that we can expose a greater number of students and a diversity of students to real authentic inquiry-based research. And a lot of that happens in upper level classes, which makes sense because these classes are more specialized. Um, you have fewer students enrolled. And so it's easier to, to develop these opportunities. Um, but in undergraduate intro courses, you really hit a huge body of students, maybe when they need help the most, when it's most crucial that we retain these students in their early careers. Um, we also have this real need in our department to increase retention in the major and because cures are uh, shown to improve this, um, we thought let's try that out, let's integrate a cure into our undergraduate curriculum, and let's hit the, that, first, that first year of biology education. And so our overarching goal um, was to completely redesign our introductory biology laboratory course here at UofL. Um, and so this used to be a one semester course. We've changed that to be a two semester sequence. Um, where in their first semester, students, um, you can sort of see our, our outline here, um, start a cure where they are involved, being involved in molecular biology um, and learning about soil chemistry and the soil microbiome. And then connecting that in the second semester uh, to a, a second cure on biodiversity um, and where they're actually really 
working on scientific literacy skills, like building hypotheses and analyzing data and learning how to present that um, in, a, in a written form. Um, and so our, our aims for the grant that funded this work or the start of this work um, was sort of, we had three specific aims, three angles that we wanted to look at. The first, which is what we'll be talking about most today, um, was just overhauling this course, completely redesigning this course from the bottom up. Um, but then we also wanted to do scholarship associated with this, um, where we could assess um, or prepare to undergraduate students for a future in science and also assess if we were doing that. So assessing how our, our cure was improving things like competency and autonomy and sense of community in the sciences. Uh, and then also because this course involves a lot of graduate student uh, teaching assistants, we wanted to prepare those grad students for a potential future in education, build their pedagogical toolkits, um, and also assess how we were doing at that. And so we'll be talking about this first aim today. Uh, we're in the first year of our grant funding. Um, this is the first year that this course has run, and so we haven't really started on aims two and three yet, but we can talk about what we've been doing in terms of developing this curriculum. Uh, so this is just an overview. Obviously, you can't read all of this text, but this is an overview of what that first semester looks like, that first semester in the two semester sequence, um, where for the first several weeks, they're getting exposed to things like the scientific method, um, and then also topics that connect with the lecture course, the biology intro lecture course that they're co-enrolled in. So uh, topics such as diffusion and osmosis, uh, photosynthesis, um, and then we get into the cure work. And so uh, here they're, and we'll show you more about this in a bit, they're getting soil samples from out in nature, they're culturing soil bacteria, they're looking at enzymatic activity in those soils, and then they're identifying their bacteria using techniques like PCR and gel electrophoresis. Um, and then they're analyzing those sequences that they get back. Uh, this is the sort of a compilation of the first page of all of the, the worksheets that students do for each of those labs in the semester. Um, we've also um, gotten rid of the, the former laboratory manual that we, was being used for the previous iteration of this course. And now all of these um, materials are, are free for the students, which is great. Um, in the second semester, um, there's fewer because we're not all the way through the second semester yet, but then we start to explore themes like functional diversity. Students get introduced to GIS to do mapping. Um, they start learning statistics um, and eventually they start uh, making their own hypotheses and analyzing data that they've been collecting across this two semester sequence. And we'll be talking about that more in detail as we go along. Um, is this, am I still talking or Rachel or are you, I forget where we were switching off. <laughs> I'll stick over from here, Natalie. No okay, <laughs> I couldn't remember. <laughs> So from here, students in Biology 241, that first semester course, they went out into the wild and collected soil samples as members of a group. So there were four students per group and one sample per group. And so we ended up with over 100 sample sites collected in Louisville. We had gotten prior permission from public parks for students to go, uh, but some students chose to get private landowner per permission. Often that was their parents' property or their guardian's property, right? So because of that, we ended up with not just soil samples on campus, though a fair bit of groups decided to do that, <laughs> the low hanging fruit of just going right outside the biology lab and collecting a sample. But some went uh, all over Louisville, so we're really excited about the coverage that the students chose to do in just one semester, fall 2021. So you can go ahead on to the next slide. Yeah, so now this is the first thing that they did once they chose their sample site. We had given them a vegetation sampling frame. And so they laid that down exactly where they were gonna collect their soil sample. And then later they were able to do a vegetation coverage estimation. So how much of the site was bare ground, how much is covered in detritus or dead plant matter, and then how much has living plants on it since that could inform hypotheses about what would be happening to soil microbiota under the surface, right? 
Also, while they were outside, other than just taking this picture, they ended up taking Latin longitude coordinates for us. Uh, they had instrumentation with them so they could take soil pH, soil moisture, and light intensity metrics too. They input all that metadata for us online using Microsoft Forms. And then once they got back into the lab with their sample, just like Natalie mentioned, they analyzed catalase activity. It's an enzyme that you can use to approximate a microbial abundance in the soil. And then later this semester in 243, they used that same soil sample to figure out functional diversity. So how many different types of microbes do they have in there based on what they eat in this uh, tool called an EcoPlate that's available for them to use. And then finally, at the end of 241, they also were able to isolate some colonies to figure out exactly what species of bacteria might be living in all these soil samples too. And so 94 samples of the many that they collected were great samples to submit for Sanker sequencing at Eurofins. And most of those samples, many of them, more than half came back with really clean uh, data like this that the students were able to score. So it was excellent work by those students. And then at the end of 241, as their culminating assignment, they're not ready for the lab report yet because they still got to learn about stats in 243. But at the end of 241, we wanted them to think about how they might communicate what they'd done to the public. So we had them create a website using Adobe Spark. And this was an individual assignment this time. So every student got an opportunity to use Adobe Spark and create really neat websites where they summarized what they'd learned about soil microbiota, why it's important, what factors might affect it so they can already start Start thinking about hypotheses for 243. And then they went through the methods. So where did they collect their sample? What was their sample site like? And when they got back in the lab, what did they do with the soil? Well, they looked at catalase activity and they ended up doing PCR on one of those samples and they grew some colonies as well. So lots of modern techniques they were able to go through and present to the public with these websites that anyone can access now and see what the students are doing in biology at the University of Louisville, which is neat. We'll let you go on to the next slide. There it goes. <laughs> and then biology 243. So now we're ready for hypothesis testing. And so they're given not just their soil sample data, but the data across all of the other student groups to bump up to a broader scale and think about what patterns do we see across sample sites and differences in microbial abundance and microbial diversity and what factors could be explaining those differences among soil samples in abundance and diversity. And so we had them visualize different uh, metrics that they thought might influence that diversity using GIS. So QGIS is freely available and can work on several different computer platforms. So not just uh, PC computers um, like the ArcGIS, pay to play software. So this was a fun opportunity for them. This particular uh, image shows canopy cover across Kentucky that they could have used to inform one of their hypotheses, but it was um, up to the student to decide what they wanted to investigate. So this was an open inquiry lab for them. And then once they figured out exactly what variables they wanted to test to determine if they explained any of the variants they were seeing in microbial abundance and microbial diversity, we gave them access to R via this great introductory level um, website that one of our colleagues, Mikas, developed using the Shiny app in R. So all students had to do was select the correct statistical test. They didn't need to worry about learning how to program or code in R just yet. We'll save that for upper level courses. As an intro biology student, we just wanted them to learn about the differences in statistical tests, how you choose an appropriate statistical test based on the variables that you're dealing with and the data that you're dealing with. And so here's one of the graphs that they could have made. They could have hypothesized that percent detritus or dead matter uh, on the sample site would explain uh, microbial abundance as estimated by catalase activity. And in this case, it produced a trend that you would expect that the more detritus at site would lead to higher abundance of microbes. And right now in Biology 243, they are writing up the results of their cure, which is neat. 
So that's aim one. We've made some good progress towards creating a curriculum that uses modern tools for these students to test original hypotheses about uh, my soil microbes. And now we're moving into thinking about two and three. As we move forward in this project, we want to assess the development of students towards their goal of becoming biologists, right? We wanna make sure that their confidence has improved, they have learning gains that are marked. We also wanna make sure that the graduate students are making gains too, if they're interested in a future career in education. So we're measuring that as well. And how we're measuring that is pre and post survey data. So we took pre surveys and we'll take post surveys soon and measure the gains across our attitudinal surveys uh, in confidence and proficiency in biology for our undergraduate students and our GTAs. We're curious how their opinions about teaching in this way uh, has changed as they've experienced it firsthand through leading this cure. We also have undergraduate teaching assistants that we're interested in assessing too in the future. Um, they are taking another course, Biology 430 or 501, where they learn about uh, modern teaching techniques um, and best practices in teaching in STEM. So in the future, we might assess them as well to see how their experience has informed them and helped their development. And I'll, I'll add that I think we've um, underestimated here the number of undergraduate students involved in this class so far. I think it's closer to a thousand after the first two semesters. So we've really been interacting with a lot of undergraduate students. Yes, for sure. Awesome. And with that, we would like to ask if there's any questions from all of you. That's fantastic. <laughs> I just had one, like, uh, question about so you mentioned you did your sequencing at Eurofins and I was wondering had you talked to the genomics core uh, is there anything that we could you know have further integration of the yeah um, from talking to other colleagues in the biology department I think I, I was under the impression that um, the genomics core didn't do Sanger sequencing oh okay so it was an equipment thing yeah yeah. Anyway, I, I was just. Um, but if if that's if that's incorrect information, then absolutely. Yeah, I'm not. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I just thought I was just thinking as as you were going along. I thought, oh, that wouldn't that be cool if if it would work out that the genomics core could be involved because we want them to get more involved in education, and then the students could actually maybe even you know go and see how it's. But I guess if, if it's needed to be the Sanger sequencing. It's yeah, I'm not, I mean, I, we can certainly reach out to them. That This is like word of mouth through uh, biology colleagues. And so well, actually, actually could give us some more information. In the upcoming, I'm, I'm not sure what day, I think it's going to be in April or anyway, one of the upcoming ones, the genomics core is going to present. So maybe if you could join, then you can, add, <laughs> we can see, they'll show you all the, uh, you know, they'll be talking about all their capabilities, but this is really awesome. Any other questions? Next question. So this is Mark Barger from Northern Kentucky University. That was a really great talk, you guys. That's really interesting. I guess the question I have is, did you have to adjust the size of your sections uh, to make it more doable to get these students involved? Yeah, so each one of our sections is capped at 24 students. Um, and so students are working in groups, um, the largest, section of 20 like if it had 24 students that would be six groups of four. Oh, and my my cat came to say hello um so we're, we're working with potentially six groups of four students in each section we did have some sections uh last semester in 241 and this semester in 243 that were smaller um just because they happened to be offered at times where uh, fewer students wanted to enroll uh, but actually, we found that having this 24 person sections was really great. Um, we had several labs where each group was sort of collecting a, a data point and then as a class they would have replication. Um, there were more students for them to be able to interact with each other and bounce ideas off of. Um, and I think some of that was lacking from our really small sections like maybe our sections that only had eight people or 10 people. And so having 24 students per section ended up being really quite nice. Um, and then, yeah, last semester in 241, we had 23 sections of 241. This semester, we have nine sections of 241. And how many sections of 243 do we have, Rachel? 
Oh, good question. I want to say it's around 15 or 16 sections. Yeah, so eventually each one of these courses is going to be offered every semester, but with two, most of the students enrolled in a fall 241, spring 243 sequence, but then some students on the, the opposite fit schedule, so a, a spring 241, fall 243 sequence, um, and then offered in the summer as well. Um, my question would be, does it matter if they get separated, you know, if, if they don't immediately follow 241 with 243, you know, since you are compiling data from everybody, maybe they don't have to have their own data from the previous semester. That's exactly right. Okay. So in 243, we essentially remind them what they did, <laughs> spend a lot of time, right, re-immersing themselves in that literature. They read primary literature and 243 and reminding them even what they did in the worksheets from 241, right, about the methods that they're about to write up. So you can have a break and still mm -hmm be able to speak intelligently about what you did. <laughs> and is it possible to register for 243 without having had 241? Is there like a prereq set in? It's a prereq, okay. so they're okay. supposed to have taken 241. I should know this, I'm in your department, but. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. The only exception is for transfer students that have taken an equivalent of 241 at a previous institution and then are jumping into 243. And we have had a few students this semester where that's become apparent. Um, but we've also heard from our graduate teaching assistants that that becomes a really great um, kind of teaching and learning moment for the undergraduates because they're working in groups. And so they have group mates that are sort of saying, okay, well, this is what we did. And now this is how we're continuing it. Um, so that hasn't seemed to cause any problems. If anything, I think it might make group dynamics um, stronger. Right. And fresh eyes on the data, which is really neat. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is really exciting and thanks for sharing all this, but I just wondered, because I think, you know, we don't have graduate students, it's very hard to get TAs. Um, how would you recommend scaling this or would you say, no, it's just too much if you only had one micro course and then maybe a follow up biotech course, which we'd love to develop here. A good question. So before I came to U of L, I taught at a small liberal arts college. And so we had undergraduate TAs that would help us in lab itself, um, and they would provide real time feedback to students. But we also found that they were really effective at reading through student drafts and providing feedback like opinions right on student work that later the faculty would grade. Um, so it helped the grading load and the just logistics to have the UTAs serve as grad as essentially graduate students on the spot to assist the teacher. Um, my classes were 24, but large at PC and we did open inquiry labs and it worked out. Um, so it's not too much, I would think, to scale it down and still do it well. <laughs> Um, hello, I, uh, I am new faculty at uh, the Bluegrass Community and Technical College, um, new from January, so brand new, and the, the new coordinator for the biotechnology program here. So I'm really interested in any resources that you guys, uh, you may have for developing cures uh, coursework in general. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of ways you can go with that, so, but it, it does seem like, um, it would be helpful to have some framework. So, or was there anything that helped you build that course or resources you could point me towards? Yeah, sure. There's a, actually a book that I can send to you later about cure development. Um, and there's a community of uh, scientists from not just biology, but chemistry and other scientific disciplines who've developed cures that work together online and communicate together online. So it's become sort of a faculty mentoring network for folks to touch base. Um, and it's a good place to get started with advice. Um, but yes, I can definitely send you the link to that uh, book that was recently published too, that gives excellent advice on how that to develop. Would be great. Yeah. yeah, yeah, shoot me an email. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I would also like oh. to add, and this is gonna sound like a, a total suck up move, but a huge part of why we were able to do this was because of the funding that we got from KY Embry. Um, we were we were tasked with overhauling this course um, before we had heard of this grant, um, and we would have done it anyway, but we were able to buy so much equipment and create a much more modern experience for the students that we would not have been able to do without the money that we got. Um, and so we're super, super grateful that that opportunity exists. 
and definitely recommend um, other folks take advantage of it because it, it was a game changer. It was an absolute game changer. So there's, there's grants and things available through. Uh, so I know that um, this program has, it was, I have materials from when Embray was Cabron. So I know that there was an initial relationship there. I think there was some bioinformatics workshops, but I would be, um, I'm just brand new and I just joined this presentation because it sounds really, you know, up the alley of what I'd like to do, but. Um, well, I want to say, so I'm the PI of the Kentucky Embray, and I want to say welcome uh, to the network, and I hope you, you know, get involved as much as possible. Um, we have, you know, we list on our website different partner institutions, but we really want everybody in Kentucky to be involved, so you're, you're eligible to apply for any of these grants, and, um, you know, just contact us, and we can give you more information, and, you um, Hopefully you can talk more with Natalie and, and Rachel, but uh, yeah, you. hopefully you can, you know, you're a part of the network. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We'll send you a link to the award itself that we got too. So if you want to apply this cycle, you can. Are they due in December again, the applications? Uh, yeah, everything's usually due in December. Excellent. Hi, Natalie, Rachel. Yeah, see you. Nice to see you again. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So I have two quick questions. Uh, the first question is about a TA. Um, I noticed you have like a 500 students and a 12 graduate TA and a 20-ish undergraduate TA. So roughly, it's like a two TA for one section of about 24 students, right? Is it the, my estimation correct? Yeah, so graduate students teach like three to four sections a piece, and each section could have 24 students, but sometimes doesn't, sometimes has less. Okay, so like a, like a for that specific lab time for that section, so it's an instructor will be in the lab, right? And there will be like a one or two TAs in the lab to assist the students, right? Oh, good question. So it's T, the graduate student for, TA or the instructor, yeah. and then yes, they like have a in, new in, TA. Yeah, like in the classroom, what is the student to faculty TA ratio, like in the classroom? Yeah, yeah. so there's one graduate student and then mm -hmm. one undergraduate student per section that serves as a teaching assistant. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Oh, yeah. yeah, I see. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And then my second question is, um, since it's research-based, right? And then one of the problems I have right now, I mean, I'm doing the same pure course at another Kentucky University, it's a chemistry-based course. So yeah. one of the questions I have right now is the students research, they are on different stage. So some doing synthesis, some doing purification, some doing characterization. So this creates some complex problems when it comes to lab report assignments, lab report grading, they're, they're on different page. So do you have these problems in your um, course management? Good question. So we've tried to keep everybody on the same pace, but there's certainly some groups each week that take longer uh -huh. than others sometimes, right? Need a little bit more assistance than others. We have okay. a one thing that's we found that's helpful to try to keep track of those group dynamics, mm -hmm. right? If there's anything that we need to know about, right? Uh, we do a lot of yeah. surveys. So for instance, at the beginning okay. of the course, we do a survey wow. to identify those students who are transfer students, right? Who may not have had 241. We identify them right yeah. away if they need us to step in. Um, we also reach out midterm to make sure groups are functioning okay. If they have any group members that are feeling okay. behind, right? Or if all of them feel okay. behind, we need to step in. Um, yeah, so yeah, surveying yeah. throughout might help keep everybody on pace. What else do you think, Natalie? What else have we done to keep folks together? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, I think you covered it. I also think that maybe there's just like a fundamental difference mm -hmm. here between these two classes, between what we have and then the chemistry class that you have set up yeah. because we, we don't have students that are doing these drastically different steps, whether you mentioned synthesis and other, other things. Yeah, and they're, so they're all doing their more independent projects. For our students, mm -hmm. it's independent in that they're developing independent hypotheses, but they're working in similar ways and on a giant data set that they've compiled kind of across the course. And so I think it's just kind of like fundamental differences in the in the way these two courses are are operating and that it sounds like you have 
this sort of dynamic situation that we just haven't had to, to deal with that same sort of um, challenge just because our students aren't being um, challenged in that same kind of way. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. Yeah. So I think, I think in my case, we have to purposely let them stagger out for this instrument usage. So they're not like all going for one instrument that way. Yeah. Gotcha. Whereas our students, it's like, okay, everybody is running polymerase chain reaction this week. Everybody is running gel electrophoresis this week. And so it's, it's not exactly the, the same. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Oh, you are muted. Yeah, sorry. I, I really think we should move on. I, I love all the great conversation, but we should move on to our next speaker. Kabede. Sorry. <laughs> Kabede. Yep. Sorry, I always <laughs> mispronounce. <laughs> oh, no, no, no problem. It's okay. Yeah. Can you introduce yourself? Or is this yeah. super casual? Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So this is Kabede Kamani. I'm from Northern Kentucky University, a chemistry professor. Uh, I'm doing research in sensor development. I'm gonna say a few points about my research. Okay, great. Are you? You have a screen to share? Yeah, sure. All right. Can you see it? It's good. Okay. So uh, I will try to be a little bit less um, technical. I'm gonna be uh, presented in uh, easy way. This is electrochemistry. It's not that easy. It's not really super easy, but I'm gonna try to make it uh, plain. So we are working on sensor development, I call it instrumental control of uh, sensors. It is just to tell that we are going a little bit away from the traditional way of uh, ion selective electrodes. So the research objective all of our total uh, objective of, of our research is to develop sensors, specifically electrochemical sensors for uh, applications in um, medicine and clinical and biomedical analysis. So I'll say why is our sensor important? Why do we go after this? Uh, even though it's my uh, specialization, I'm very, very interested in it too. So just let me say the advantages of electrochemical sensors. So normally biomedical uh, measurements involve or just we do biomedical measurements for diagnosis and treatment of diseases. So this measurement must be very accurate and they have to be precise and uh, fast. If possible, they have to be made online. So another thing is we do measurements, normal biomedical uh, measurements in complex mixtures, complex samples such as blood, uh, cell tissue, cells, tissues, and the like. And therefore, what we, uh, our sensor must be selective to what we intend to measure. Overall, if it is a list of, a lot of list of advantages of uh, ion selective electrodes, our electrochemical sensors, I don't want to read this all, they are selective, sensitive, fast, if we come to this end, it is in situ detection. It's possible to <clears throat> detect in situ. So uh, Professor Marco there, he was using electrochemistry to uh, measure ions and uh, animals. So it's possible to miniaturize them. Very small sensors can be made and they can be uh, used in, for in vivo measurements. So why instrumental control then? 
from the traditional chemistry, from the, the traditional measuring protocol, what are we changing and what are we trying to develop? I'm going to focus on that. So the working principle of classical electrochemistry is that simple. It's just like battery that we use. So we have a reference electrode which provides a constant voltage and unselective electrode which provides a potential as a function of the sample uh, concentration of the uh, sample in the solution. And the key point here is the membrane, which is selective. When we talk about ion selective electrodes, we mean ion selective membranes. So it is basically this membrane which functions all of the work. Okay. So classically, this measures potential under zero current conditions. Look, we are not measure, uh, applying any current. The potential develops because of the concentration of the ions in this solution. So potential difference will happen between the working electrode and the uh, reference electrode. We measure that potential here, and that gives us the concentration of the analyte we are looking for. So the limitation of this that we are trying to fix is that this is limited to chemical selectivity. Any selectivity advantage of it is based on the membrane we use, just the chemistry of the membrane is the factor. So how can we input or add instrumental control on the selectivity? That's what we are trying to do in my research. So the main limitation of this classical potentiometry is it is irreversible. I'm going to tell in a second what is meant by its reversibility. And there is a lack of selective carriers for anions. Anions are not as simple as cations, they are multi-element like, for example, perchlorate, carbonate, and the, bicarbonate, and the like. And they are different in their size, in their shape. So it's not very easy to uh, produce, make select, selective carriers for these ions, okay? So that is one limitation that we are trying to address in my work. How can we instrumentally make up for this limitation? Let me show you this. This is the uh, measurement of uh, heparin. Heparin is platinar, uh, which is very much widely used in uh, billions every year. So what is meant by a reversible sensor? Let me talk about this one. Our membrane contains this carrier. It is called triduodecyl methyl ammonium chloride. This uh, thing that I'm sure I've shown here is TDMA, and it has carry a positive charge. It is with chloride. Chloride is hydrophilic, and this large species TDMA is uh, uh, lipophilic. Chloride is hydrophilic. When we do our measurement, for example, this is heparin. Heparin is gonna go to into the membrane, and it displaces the chloride. The chloride goes out. The heparin stays in. Heparin is by far more lipophilic than chloride and therefore it prefers to stay in the membrane. Once it's extracted inward, it will not go out. And therefore our electrode will be just single use equipment since the process is not reversible. The process the, which goes in will not go out. Therefore we cannot reuse it again and again. Okay, this is the limitation of uh, this take uh, this classical sensors. How can we make up for this? Take this one into your mind. We have here a lipophilic TDMA and a hydrophilic chloride. This is called ion exchanger. In our uh, technique, we are trying to uh, elevate this. We are not using zero current anymore. As you can see here, we add uh, so-called uh, counter electrode and because of this we apply current and we have a control on our sensor now not only chemical selectivity we are going to introduce instrumental selectivity in here what we are doing as i have shown in here is this is what is present in our sensor it's not a simple hydrophilic and lipophilic thing we have all lipophilic things, positively charged lipophilic species and negatively charged lipophilic species, which try to stay in the membrane, do not go leave the membrane. So when we measure what we do is we apply current, that current will 
arrange one kind of charge on one side. Here, for example, positive charges are aligned towards the sample side, and negative charges are in towards the inside of our membrane. Inside is this way, and outside is this way. So since the positive sides are towards our membrane, we can measure now negatively charged species like heparin itself. Okay. Since now, when we put our uh, uh, current in galvanostat in, in uh, uh, zero current mode or potential static mode, the membrane will try to spread the ions like this, okay? And because of this, uh, there is no chance that uh, uh, heparin stays in because there is no charge accumulation on one of the sides. And therefore, the heparin which was extracted will go out and we can do this again and again, and then we can repeatedly use this sensor. So we make it reversible. And so because of the reversibility, our sensor will be reverse, uh, reusable and we can use it again and again. So that is the advantage we are uh, contributing to, to this uh, uh, technology. Okay, that is what I called instrumental control of insulative electrodes. This work was really uh, successful. We uh, did a very good job here at uh, um, Northern Kentucky University where we measured contaminants in heparin preparations. If maybe some people remember in around 2000, 2007 and 2008, heparin contamination killed a lot of people and those are high charge density species. So I tried, we tried to measure those in our lab. We measured high charge density contaminants at concentrations as little as 0 0.3 ppm, which is very, very good. And that concentration is no more uh, contaminant to heparin. So this, is, this was a very good job. So this could be attained because of the instrumental control of our sensor. Another thing that we did is we uh, determined the concentration of uh, dextran sulfate and pentose polysulfate. These are species which are exactly the same as heparin in their structure. And using this technology, we developed a new sensing technology called chronopotentiometry. And I'm gonna tell what the advantage of this chronopotentiometry is compared to what we used to have classical potentiometry. Okay, so in our current research, we are using the technology we developed for a, an ambitious and very a, a good and big research. We are planning to develop or screen antidote for low molecular weight heparins. Many of you might have heard, I don't know, I'm not quite, quite sure, but just heparin and potamine are not. Uh, anticoagulant and antidote of choice, but we don't have any option. That's why we are using them. For example, heparin is not allowed to be used in uh, children at all because it has a lot of complications, causes bleeding complication and causes a lot, of, caused a lot of disease. So it's not really recommended. And therefore, people are now going toward this molecule, uh, just low molecular weight heparins. It's heparin, but it's broken down, fractionated into smaller units and just selected. So the heparin that we call is, heparin is not clean. It's just directly brought from animal body. But this one is either synthesized in the lab, or it can be fractionated from the uh, unfractionated protein and therefore it is more efficient and it is safer. So, for, but the problem with this for now is we don't have anticoagulant, I'm sorry, antidote for it to remove it. Patient takes heparin, we give that patient protamin to take out the heparin from the body of the patient. In the same way, if we give this low molecular with heparin, it has to be removed, but we don't have that facility so far. So we are planning to develop this in two different ways. We can fractionate, break down the protamine, which is larger, and see if it can be antidote for this low molecular weight heparins. Another way is just to synthesize. Okay, we did, I did uh, in my research before uh, to develop 
peptides, small peptides of uh, under 20 amino acids. And we developed that and we have tried if this species, these peptides can bind heparin. It is just, there is a good sign that they can work. So we can test this and change the amino acids, the arrangement and the like, and try to develop antidotes for this low molecular weight heparin. That is the big uh, project that I'm working on now. So what I've shown here is to see with uh, pentosin polysulfate and uh, uh, dextrin sulfate, we have tried this, as you can see here. This shows the addition of dextrin sulfate. When we add protamine into it, Z, it is reversed in this direction. You can just look at this slope and this slope to save time. What we can tell is that we can bind protamine to pentosin polysulfate and take it out of the body of the patient. So in the same way, we can try it for low molecular weight heparin. We can synthesize or we are just, we are not synthesizing. We are just uh, uh, design the structure of the peptide and send to peptide companies. There are a lot of uh, peptide companies which produce, make it as you order. So we can order those and try if they can be used for low molecular weight heparin. So we can, after time for sure, by just adjusting, redesigning the structures, we can, we are positive that we can have these uh, efficient antidotes for low molecular weight heparin. This is one big research we are doing now. Second is determine direct detection of anion gap. Anion gap is one of the things that is measured to, uh, during whenever any patient goes to the clinic. So far, people are doing this by measuring sodium, potassium, chloride, and bicarbonate. Anion gap is given by this equation, total cations minus total anions. But these four ions are separately measured, and calculation is made to calculate uh, uh, anion gap. What we have tried so far in, in my lab is that we can use our technology, which I just mentioned, in a single spot, uh, in a single shot, we can measure all measurable cations and all measurable anions. And therefore, we can calculate this anion gap from total cations minus total anions. We have seen a lot of uh, good work so far and we are planning to continue that way. This is excellent work. If, it, if we are successful, that will be really groundbreaking. That is really very good uh, research. And another thing is selectivity enhancement. I just mentioned that anions do not have good uh, ionophores because of their different shapes, different sizes, and because of this, they interfere with each other. For example, in our bodies, the important ions are chloride and bicarbonate. We want to measure that for diagnosis purposes so many times. But if a patient is, for example, under aspirin therapy, uh, normally aspirin breaks down into salicylate. This is strongly interfering with chloride because it is lipophilic. Okay, So it's not possible to measure chloride even in a small amount of, in the presence of small amount of salicylate. For tobacco, tobacco smokers, there is what we call as thiocyanate in the blood of people, of the smokers, that also is lipophilic and strongly interferes. Even though these are interference, they are very, very low in concentration. So kinetically, we can control that. We remove it from the surface of the membrane by pulling it into the membrane. And therefore, since our sensor normally measures the concentration at the phase boundary right here, we can have just pure chloride, and then we can measure uh, uh, chloride in the presence of thiocyanate or in the presence of salicylate. So my project overall now focuses on this. And finally, what we call a simultaneous determination of extracellular and intracellular potassium. Potassium is important as electrolyte and also in the, intra intra in the cell it is a very good biomarker, especially for early detection of hypertension development. And it is a very important research area. So in our research, we are planning to do these measurements at the same time. What we are doing is we measure potassium in the plasma by 
uh, first, and then during what we call as potential static pulse, we can add surfactants and more uh, solvent so that the cell is broken, and then the potassium in cell will be released to the uh, uh, plasma mix. So I'm um, sorry, the potassium in the cell and outside of the cell will mix, and we are going to measure the total. Total minus the one from the plasma gives us the total as the concentration of potassium and red blood cells. And this also is an interesting project that we have worked on for a long time, except so far we are not successful in actual blood, but with artificial blood we made in our lab and with other in electrolytes, it is very good. So the fourth project we are working on is this one. I thank you for uh, coming and for listening to me. If you have any question, I would be happy to answer. It's very, very busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any questions? So, Kabeta, I have a, I have a question. Okay. Thanks for the uh, shout out before about some of the in vivo work. So, I guess if we were to try this in vivo, can you give us, me a sense of like how large the electrodes are? The electrodes can go to just very, very micro. Uh, uh, I can tell. Um, and micrometer thickness, in micrometer thickness. So it is, uh, people have tried to work, uh, I did my um, postdoc at the University of Michigan, Professor Mark Mirhoff is a very well-known electrochemist. And he used to make this and really, really, tiny, very, very thin in micrometer thickness and not even just for one time measurement. The implant in the uh, uh, research animals in, in, in uh, Banis and they keep there for days and keep on collecting data. So they can be mini miniaturized to very, very tiny. Great. Yeah. Yeah, 10, 10 microns, you said? That, that's... I'm not sure 10, okay. but it is in micrometer. Okay, nice. Yeah. nice. Uh, yeah. Mark, also, well, you tried, right? How, uh, how small did you go? Well, with the um, carbon electrodes we had, I'm trying to remember what the surface area was at the tips of those. Um, it was on a micron scale as well, but I can't remember exactly how many microns were um, exposed there. I'd yeah, so excellent. So that is that much. And people even tried to do research in animal brain. So they are going very, 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 very little, small sizes. Uh, we are not there. We are just doing uh, research in uh, our research is macro now. It's not that micro. Nice. Yeah, sorry, we've gone over again. And <laughs> Any other questions? I just had a quick one, Kavite. Um, So this is more of a general question. <clears throat> How do you get such, I mean, your, your data looks beautiful, one. Maybe it's just because you're an analytical chemist. But number two, how do you, it seems like you do a really good job of publishing. What, what are your secrets to, you know, getting those papers out the door? <laughs> so I know that's one of my struggles. <laughs> yeah, not, yeah, just, uh, uh, yeah, um, actually this uh, pulsed chronopotentiometry technology that we are doing now is really, really powerful. This technology is what uh, we started working on when I was a PhD student. And a lot of uh, uh, successful work is being done. There is a very huge interest in this area. So I, I would say that other than that, my students were, I don't know that, uh, lucky now, I had students who were really working like graduate students, maybe uh, if somebody knows Simon and uh, Emma, those students were really, really interesting and excellent students. And we tried a lot, Michael, and I see uh, just your work that is so, so successful. It might be biochemistry. Other than that, I, I see that. so. Uh, we just published 
three papers. Uh, we have maybe two or so on the line. Um, I can say okay. I am not super, uh, uh, I cannot say that we are really very, very successful, but I can say we are kind of okay. Thank you so much, Michael. Okay, thanks. All right, well, I guess we should uh, wrap this up. So thanks everybody. Um, this was really interesting. And we'll see you next time. I think we're gonna have a presentation by one of the cores or maybe both the cores. Thank you so much. I'm sorry right, I was you. not that much uh, there because it was Wednesday, my spring semester and fourth semester, uh, Wednesday was extremely busy. So yeah, I no. wish I got the chance to attend this kind of interesting. Well, it's, it's, it'll be recorded so you can. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, All thank right, you. Bye -bye. Thank you.